Hello everyone. In this video, we'll continue where we left off in class on Monday, but just a couple of very quick notes before we do that. One quick thing just with regard to the homework. I mentioned this in class yesterday. The JPEG files that some of you are sending me, we're having a lot of problems. Sometimes, like I mentioned, the files are just too big, so they're getting rejected. Other times, they may go through, but they just take so, so long to go through. They're showing up something like 24 hours after some of you have sent the email. So again, just a reminder, I'd highly recommend avoiding JPEGs. We're gonna have to talk about this for some of our take-home tests that are gonna come up to make sure we have a secure way and not something that may get caught up in email. So I highly, highly recommend now starting to get used to other methods. How do you scan your homework in? You know, an app like TurboScan, a free app that if you have a smartphone, if you have a printer at home, a lot of them have a scanning feature. If you're on campus, there are a lot of scanners that are available that you could use. So we really want to try and get PDF files for turning in anything through online, through email. That's definitely our best way. The second thing, just thinking about test number one, we finished chapter five. I really think chapters five and six go very well together, so I don't wanna stop and separate them. I wanna have a test that combines both of them. But I also realize that we're getting a lot of material here. So we're gonna have our first test after we finish chapter six, so that'll take us a few days to work through. We're getting sort of close, but we're still at least a few weeks away. And I haven't finalized all the details on that test yet, like the date, but the other thing I wanted to mention, our first test is going to be take home or online in some fashion. Like I said, I'm still working on the exact details on how we'll do that, but just so you realize, there is a lot of information here, but for that first test, you're still trying to get to know me. If you've been following in class, the problems that you'll see on that first test will be remarkably similar to what you've been doing in the homework and what we've been doing in class together. But I also kind of like, it's a long test and our first test. So for both of those reasons, I like that being one that you can take at home and that would also be an open book situation. Open book, open notes, and hopefully that'll help us get off to a good start with our first test. Our later tests won't cover quite so much material. We'll definitely have at least a couple of them in class, but again, we'll deal with that when we get there. Okay, so back to chapter six. The first aspect in chapter six, they introduce this concept of what is a distribution? A distribution of a variable or a data set refers to the way its values are spread over all possible values. So basically a distribution can basically be all of the data values, but more typically a distribution can be shown vis visually with a table or a graph. So that's normally what we're a little more accustomed to. When we are given a distribution of a variable or a distribution of a data set, we're basically getting some picture of all of the data. So we've seen so many of our bars and charts and things of that nature. And as we get a little deeper, I'll remind you what we did in class, that when we have some of these bar charts, the idea of the distribution is exactly the same, but instead of bars, these rectangular blocky bars, will fit these smooth curves on top of these types of figures. So we'll get to that, but our first big point of this lesson is now that we're looking at a distribution, what do we know about it? What can we get out of it? Well, the graphs help. All the graphs and tables and visual displays help give us a sense of what's going on in that data set. But one of the first questions is, that we should follow up with is what is the average? And we, when we say what is the average, we can get in a few synonyms here. What is common? What is typical? Okay, those are the other things. What is in the middle? That's another way to look at it. So all these little situations, I mean, think about it. You get a test back, a lot of students, certainly they wanna know their grade, but they're also curious to compare to the rest of the class. So one way to do that would be to know what is the average test grade. If you're thinking about joining a new, uh, taking a new job, starting at a new company, you know, certainly you want to know your salary, but the average salary, these are very, very common pieces of information that are going to help our picture. Now, I'll just say right now, in statistics, it's always about getting more. 
So first having the visual display, that helps, that tells us. But what gives us more? Well, this idea of average will give us more. Later on, we'll talk about knowing the variability of a data set will also tell us more. But for right now, this is where we're starting. What is common? What is typical? What is in the middle? So, you know, again, it's used so often, you may be surprised it does not always have the same meaning. And because it doesn't quite always have the same meaning, we end up getting these three different terms in statistics for this idea of average. We get what we call the mean, we get the median, and we get the mode. Now, on the next page, they give us these formal definitions. But just before we jump in, let's get that quick idea that we're getting some different synonyms and they're very similar for what's going on, what is common, what's the middle, what is the average. But let's try and associate each one of these here. The idea of the mean is what most of us think of when we talk about the idea of average, okay? When I ask you if you play basketball, what is your average number of points per game? Or again, as a worker, what is the average salary? Test scores, what was the average test score? Most of us already have a preconceived notion on how we're gonna get that value, and that notion corresponds with the mean. Just a quick reminder, right, what is that notion? That notion is add up all the data values and divide by how many you have. If you've played four basketball games, add the points scored in each of those games, divide by four, and that is your average. If you've taken four tests, how do you get your average? Add up the four test scores, divide by four. So that's, that's what uh, most of us are a little more familiar with. But now we need to associate that word. The word mean is connecting to that idea of average. And to take it a little bit deeper, the, the mean is the arithmetic middle. So that little display that they have here, they're trying to point out the mean. If we could stack all of our values together in this type of fashion and lay them on a flat board, the mean would be the value where we could put this, this little middle wedge and it would balance both sides. It is that. That's why there also is that sense of middle here, but we mostly associate the word average. The idea of median is where we associate the word middle. There's one little catch here. When we start thinking about median, all of this goes with numerical data, with quantitative data, literally having values that you could add and then divide. Here, before we can talk about the middle, our data values must be ordered. We have to put them either from smallest to biggest or biggest to smallest, but there has to be some order. Well, we can only have that order if we are dealing with numerical data values. And then finally, this word mode, this is the most common value. Now, if we go back to qualitative data sets, this is all we have, right? There's no way to, if we're looking at over here, they're talking about, um, you know, number of movies in a series. So these different series, there are four alien movies, there are seven Planet of the Apes movies, and so on. But if I want to know any sense of average here, what is common, there's nothing to add. Just adding these values together doesn't do anything because these numerical values are just giving us a count how many Star Trek movies there are, how many Star Wars movies there are. Notice this is 2013, so we're missing several of the newer Star Wars movies. How many Terminator movies that there are. So in this type, we're just counting the number of movies. We're basically looking at qualitative data here. This would be like some of the polls that we've talked about. You know, what kind of car do you drive? Four people have a Ford. Seven people have a Toyota. Twelve people have a Honda. You know, that same type of situation. How do we know what's common? We just look at which one has the highest frequency. So here, Star Trek would be the most common out of these because it has the most number of, of movies. If these were colors, and maybe this is the color blue, blue would be the most common answer because most people had that preference. So that gives us the broad sense of what these terms, what we're really focusing on. And by the way, most of today's lesson is going to be focused on these three terms. Most of the homework revolves around these. The thing with mode, 
we'll see that there's not always just one mode. All we're looking at is what is the most common value. Well, there could be a tie. So I think sometimes our book, it gets a little carried away trying to get you to think of possibilities. They, in a few spots, I didn't assign these problems, but just if you flip through, there are some problems where they ask, how many modes do you think there would be? I think that's a little above our pay grade, to be honest. So this kind of reminds me a little bit, some of you were asking me back in the 5E homework with correlation, one of the problems had a last part trying to get you to speculate a little bit. Why do you think there is a positive or a negative correlation? What is the relationship between those two variables that would form that positive or negative relationship? Some of those, you know, we can try and talk a little bit about like height and weight. And again, it makes sense. The taller you are, the more you might weigh. It's not perfect, but that's a natural phenomenon. But others, Again, I'm, I'm a little surprised at what they're trying to get out of you. So like so many of the other spots, don't let that bother you. Back in that previous section, it was about identifying the right type of correlation, being able to make the scatter plots. Here, we want to try and get some deeper understanding on these terms, which one might be better or more appropriate. And we'll talk a little more about that. But the first point of focus, the major point of focus, is to understand how to find each one when requested. So, if we go to the next page, we get all those formal terms. The mean, just like we said, commonly called the average value. It is found as follows. The mean equals the sum of all values, add all your values together, divide by the total number of values. So add all the points you got from your test or all the points you scored in your game or all the salaries that the employees earned and then divide by the total number of tests, the total number of games you played, the total number of employees that you surveyed. So that is our arithmetic average. The median is the middle value in a sorted data set. So the big key here is that again, it is sorted, it is ordered. Doesn't matter if you go small to big or big to small, but we have to have that sense of order. So once we have that order, we go to the absolute middle value, or we have to realize, and we'll play with this and see it for ourselves, there might be two middle values, so we average those two middle values to get the median. Last but not least, the mode is the most common value in a distribution. Which value has the highest frequency? Okay, the only catch here, if there's a tie, we can have multiple modes, but the only catch here is that there has to be a repetition. If no values repeat, you don't say all the values are the mode, we would simply say no mode. So they give a nice example, and I would encourage you to go through this one. I think it'll be good if we do one our, on our own here. Let's get some practice finding all those different values we were talking about, and then start to get some sense about why we care one over the other, which might be the better, the better use, which one might give us the better sense of what is average, what is common, what is the middle. So this very first problem, I'm just giving you a bunch of quiz scores and keeping it simple. These quizzes are just out of 10 points. So I've got one student got a seven out of 10, then a nine out of 10, then this student had a perfect 10 out of 10, then a seven out of 10, a two out of 10, a one out of 10, an eight out of 10, a nine out of 10, a five out of 10. Let's find the mean, median, and mode. So the mean, and we keep saying it, I just gotta add all these values. So I'm gonna be completely literal here. 7 plus 9 plus 10 plus 7 plus 2 plus 1 plus 8 plus 9 plus 5. Literally took every value, every data value we had, added them together. Divide by how many total values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we had 9 students. Now, on your calculator, you know, depending on your calculator, but most of us have something like this where we've got a little bit of a screen that we could use, not just the old calculator, you just type in buttons and get your answer on the screen. So you can do this all at once. Just be careful if you do this all at once, 
you need parentheses. If you just literally enter seven plus nine plus 10 plus blah, 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 plus five divided by nine, the calculator knows order of operations. It would just do five divided by nine and then proceed to add all these values. So you want to do it all at once. Just make sure you take, you know, not take advantage. You need to use the parentheses, but most of us just do this in two steps. First, add them all up. You see, enter. I get a total of 58. And 58 divided by 9, 6.4 repeating. Roughly, you know, we'll round off here. You know, some of us remember that's a constant four. You put the little bar on that to show that. But our average quiz score, our mean quiz score would be a 6.4. That's a nine here. So that's it. It's just that simple. We should, you know, even when we have different types of numbers, we should have a little bit of number sense to be able to tell, is that right? Is that wrong? Again, that idea of mean has something to do with middle average common. So when I look at this, well, this looks right. This feels right. I see several quizzes that are lower than this. I see several quizzes that are higher than this. This feels right. Now, if you made a minor goof and you got like 6.7 or maybe like, I don't, I don't know, 5.9, you probably wouldn't be able to tell. You know, you accidentally entered an eight instead of a nine. There are possibilities for minor mistakes. So little things, writing this out, you know, this is a good way for partial credit, just so I see, oh, you made a little mistake on your total, but you have the right idea. If you just do all the work on your calculator and give me an answer and it's wrong, but I don't see any work, there's very little I can do for you with regard to partial credit. I can't guess what you did and what went wrong. I need to see what you did in order to assign partial credit. So a few little things here, but other things should be obvious. If you got an answer of like 0.64, I mean, that's not even a realistic quiz score. That is lower than the lowest quiz score, not to mention there's no negatives here or anything like that, but that should stand out. Wow, I did something wrong with my arithmetic. Or on the other side, if you got the average quiz score is a 26 or, you know, a 13.2, that's, it just doesn't make any sense with the data. The mean should sort of be in the middle. So even if it's just a matter of does the value fall between the lowest and highest values as just a quick check to make sure we didn't make a silly arithmetic mistake. Okay, but that's it. And for most of us, that is the easiest. That's the one we're the most familiar with. So certainly want to get some practice with it. And these are easy values. You know, the book used some dollars. One big thing to realize, units. If there are units on your data values, you still have units on your mean. If this was, you know, how long did it take you to finish the quiz in minutes? Well, then this still has units, minutes. So that would be one thing. But here, these are just test quiz scores. So these are points. So I guess if you wanted to label this points, you could do that. But that would be a little unnecessary. But for any other unit, the one in the book, they've got dollars. We'll use dollars in another example in just a moment. But if they've got dollars as units, then your mean should have dollars as units as well. Okay, next, let's take a look at the median. Well, here's that problem, everybody. If you don't order the data set and you just start talking about what is in the middle, well, that's a very, very common mistake. How do you figure out what is the middle spot? Well, there's two ways to do that. Some people just work from both sides. Cross one off on this side, cross the second off on both sides, the third off on both sides, the fourth off on both sides, and that would be your middle data value. But if you say the median is a score of two, that is incorrect. Because the whole key to a median, it's not just the middle value, it's the middle value in a sorted set. This is not sorted, this is not ordered. So that's where we have to start here. We have to put these values in order. So we get one, two, five, seven, seven, What do we got? Then comes 
8, 9, 9, and 10. So now we do that same thing, work from both sides, keep working my way in until I get to that middle value. And in this one, the median would equal seven. Technically, you wanna be clear. There are two students who scored a seven here. It's this seven is the median, but there's really no distinguishing between them. But just to realize, it's not they're both the median. That's just a little coincidence. It's just this particular data value. Now, let's play a few games here because this one worked out very nicely. There was one middle data value. So two things. Number one, go back for a second. How do you find the middle data value? Some people like to associate this with the median. This idea of n plus 1 divided by 2, n is that total number of data values. So in this case, it would be the total number of quiz scores, the total number of students that we have quiz scores for. So if you apply that formula here, you get 9 plus 1 divided by 2 equals 5. But to realize that 5, that doesn't tell me the median is 5. That tells me the fifth spot. That once I order my data, go to the fifth spot. And now it doesn't matter which way you count. Start from the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Start from the right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Either way, we're hitting that same value. But like I said, let's make a little change here. I'll, we got a few little tweaks that I wanna make here to get full experience in how we find these different values. But the first thing is, let's just add one more value and to keep it simple, let's add another 10. So that way in my ordered list, I can just add that 10 to the end here. So now we're done with that. Now I've got 10 quiz values because I added that extra 10 at the end. Those are just coincidences, right? That this quiz score is a 10 and that this n value is 10. That's just a coincidence. But now that we have that set up, well, let's see the difference. Now, if I do that count in process, eliminate the outer, then the second outer, then the third outer, keep working my way in. Now, I don't come to one middle value. I come to two middle values. Now, I take the average of those two, and that represents my median. So now I will get 7 plus 8 divided by 2. We're not dividing by n here. We're just dividing by 2 because we're just averaging these two values. That's 15 divided by 2. And now our median would be 7.5. If you do this little formula... Well, now n is 10, we get 10 plus 1 divided by 2, 11 divided by 2. That does not come out cleanly. When this technique, when it does come out to a clean number, you go to that spot, and that spot represents your median. When you get this kind of a decimal number, which you're always dividing by 2, okay, that formula to compute the median would always be a divide by 2. So it's either you get a whole number or you get something with a 0.5. Those are the only two possibilities. If you get the decimal 0.5, take the whole number before and after. So 5.5, we'd be looking at the fifth and sixth spots and that we would have to average those together. So here we got one clean number, we go to that spot and we're done. Here we're getting the decimal, so it's telling us to look at two spots and then average those spots, average the values that occupy those spots. And once again, doesn't matter which way you count. If you went smallest to biggest and start counting here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, these are the two values we care about. If you started from the big and went to the small or started here and went from the right to the left, one, two, three, four, five, six. The first way, this was the fifth, this was the sixth. The second way, this was the fifth, this was the sixth. But it doesn't matter. We're still going to the same two values. We need to average those two values. 
and the median would be 7.5. Okay, let's keep this going again. Now we talk about the mode, and that's the only two possibilities here. I mean, we could have more data values, and if you start having something like 20, 25, 30 data values, again, that little moving your way from the outside to the inside, that can become a little tedious. It's much nicer to do something like this, that if I have 25 data values, I know 25 plus one divided by two would equal 13, go to the 13th spot. Still gotta put them in order first, if they weren't already given to us in order, but that would be the situation. It makes it a little bit faster, but then again, it's not like it's so hard to work from the outside and then to count your way until you get to the middle. So those are the two possibilities that we have for the median. Now for the mode, let's include this last 10. Actually, you know what, let's, let's forget it, that's here. Let's go back to the original data set. Here, it's helpful. We're looking for the most commonly occurring value. So in order to find the most commonly occurring value, it really helps to put them in order. If you're just kind of looking all over, again, there's only nine values here, so it's not that hard to see. Okay, I've got two sevens. Okay, I've got two nines. But, you know, again, even when you start getting up to 20, 25, it's easy to miss a repeat value or to see that something occurred twice and miss that there was actually a third time that that value came up. So putting them in numerical order, which we already did for the median, it really actually does help us for the mode. Because now it just makes a quick and easy scanning and I can immediately see, okay, I've got sevens that repeated, I've got nines that repeated, and again, for the moment, we'll pretend that's not there. We'll go back to the original. So with this setup, formally we would call this a bimodal set, by bi, that prefix just referring to two, and that the modes would be seven and nine. We had two people got a seven and two people got a nine. If we go to this next set where I included the extra 10, well now it's a tie. We've got two sevens, we've got two nines, we've got two tens. Now that would be a trimodal set and all three of these would be the mode. But this is what I was saying earlier. If you're just randomly looking at a situation but not looking at the data values, I don't think it's too obvious to know how many modes there would be. I think I kind of got to collect the data to see that. But now let's keep adjusting this though. Let's stick one more seven in here. So let's pretend we have one, two, five, seven, 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 eight, nine, nine, ten, ten. Let's now look at those, and now we've got 11 quiz scores. With that set up, we've got several values repeat, but it's not just that they repeat, it's which one repeats the most. So I still have two tens, I still have two nines, but now I've got three sevens. There are more sevens than anything else. So now we would just have a mode of seven. So that's the first big bit, everybody. Just trying to establish what are these different values. Be familiar with the terminology. Not that you need to give a definition, although honestly, from what we're saying here, we basically are repeating the definition, but we need to understand so we can answer the question. If we're asked to find the mean, median, mode, if you don't know what any of those words mean, you really don't even know where to start. So. Definitely want to do another problem, but we need to introduce a little situation here. We need to introduce the formal term of what is an outlier. An outlier in a data set is a data value that is either much higher or much lower than almost all the other values. We'll see in just a moment. We're going to do a little work to prove this, to demonstrate this fact but an outlier can change the mean of a data set, but does not affect the median or the mode. So again, we'll point out how that works in just a moment. But here's the first thing, everybody. This is another place we're getting a taste of statistics. If we did more work with statistics, we would get a formal formula to figure out what qualifies as an outlier. 
how far, how much bigger or how much lower from the other data values does it take to make it an outlier? Because some people see this, and now anytime they see a big value or a small value, they're just ready to shout, outlier. So we're looking at a bunch of test grades, and one student got 100, the second highest test grade is an 88, and students wanna say that student who got a 100 is an outlier. That's not true. Again, we'll demonstrate in a moment what a real outlier is, how, how much an outlier can skew the perception of a situation, but that's not it. Okay, like I said, I, I almost hate, we need to introduce this term, but without giving more of, a, more of a formula to see how much bigger, how much lower, it's kind of like we're just aware that outliers exist, but we ourselves should not be trying to declare any values an outlier right off the bat. Oh, let me go backwards for one second. Just looking, going to the original data set, we had a mean of 6.4, a median of the original median was 7, and then a mode of 7. In this situation, all three of those values are fairly close. We shouldn't expect them all to be exactly the same. There is one case, a very nice distribution type that we'll get to later in Chapter 6, where all three are exactly the same. That's, that's such a nice, fortunate thing. But in a lot of data sets, they're fairly close. So which one of these is the best representation of what is the middle, what is common, what is average? In this one, they're all pretty good. There's no one that's clearly off in any way. Now again, what do I mean by off? We'll point that out in just a moment. But for right now, just to realize, all three of these are doing a good job. Even if we go to the second data set, although if I did, I'd have to readjust. I never did the mean with that extra 10 in there. But just looking at those, again, they're in a very close ballpark. That's another nice thing, but it doesn't have to be that way. So we want to be aware of the existence of an outlier and what it can do, but we should not be the ones to jump out and say, oh, that's an outlier. That one is versus that one is not. So as we move along here, I want to do basically the same thing we just did up here with these salaries and then we can come back to this conversation of an outlier and get a little bit of a better sense, a better picture on, again, what might be best. So here I listed the annual salaries for all employees in some company. And this is it. All the employees, it's a small company, they literally have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven employees. And I also did us a little favor here. I already put these values in order, okay? Then I just want us to realize, a lot of times we're just given a bunch of values, so if we get to the median, we have to put them in order, but realize sometimes we are given that favor that they are already in order. So let's go reverse this time. Let's start off with the mode. For the mode, I'm looking for the value that repeats the most. Well, literally no value repeats. Every single one of these values is unique and shows up exactly one time. This is where we warned some people where we saw up here, it's like, oh, if we have a tie, we get multiple modes, but you have to have something that repeats. So since no value repeated here, this data set has no mode. Now, to be quite honest, the mode is helpful, but big picture, the mode is extremely useful, again, with qualitative data sets, because that's all we have. It's just, again, for those categorical data sets, what car do you drive, what sneaker brand do you prefer, um, what mode of transportation do you use to get to school, to work, those things, all we can do is collect answers and tally them and see which answer had the most responses, had the highest frequency. So that's a huge bonus for the mode. But for our numerical data, sometimes it comes up, but the median and mean are more commonly used here. So now if we do the median, and if we think about that, we've got seven employees, so n equals seven. If I use my little formula trick, I get eight divided by two is four. Now this should be even more obvious. 
Up here, when I use the formula, you could be under, it's understandable to see why a student would mistake this for the final answer. Because five also happens to be a quiz score. But again, this just tells you what spot. Now that makes it even more clear. It wouldn't make any sense at all to say the median salary is four. There is no salary of four. It again, it's the fourth spot. So one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, either going from small to big or big to small. But either way, that is my fourth value. So my median is $49,000. And like I said before, you have to include the units. You have the units here, include the units with your answer here. Now here's the big one, everybody. When I go to the mean, look at what happens here. I'm not gonna write out like I did. I'm just gonna start getting to work, putting these numbers in and adding. Careful here, everybody. You know, this is where I was saying it's kind of tough. These numbers are getting bigger to have a good number sense at the end as what did you do? Is that correct? So let's be very careful. We don't accidentally miss zeros or anything like that. It's easy to do something like that and accidentally enter 3,000 when it needs to be 37,000. We keep going. Let's So there is our total. We get $1,534,550 divided by seven employees. So I didn't show all the little this plus this plus this plus this, but I still showed the total. So just doing that little work, showing me that total of what you got when you added it all together, showing me the total number of employees, you know, I could see if you get the wrong answer at the end, you accidentally wrote six here instead of seven. You miscounted the number of employees. You made a little calculator mistake, got the wrong total. Maybe it's not even a calculator mistake. You just transcribed, made a little mistake when you're moving this value over. So little things, but just to write a little bit down, make sure we get some partial credit at a minimum. And for a lot of our calculators, everybody, don't forget, once you already have an answer, I'll just immediately go divide and it's taking my previous answer. I don't even have to recopy it. So this would be, again, get my unit dollars here, $219,221 and cents. If this is cents, we should round here, right? We don't go past the penny spot, so that would be 43 cents. Okay. Now let's get back to that discussion about what is accurate, what is best. Which one of these, well, this one, we don't even have a mode. So which one of these better reflects the situation for the employees? Which one of these better reflects what is in the middle, what is the average salary? Well, if you use the mean, you're looking at a mean of almost $220,000. $220,000. You're talking about seven times to almost four times what every other employee is making except for this person. I almost meant to say this when we started. Small company, maybe we've got one person who's kind of our custodial staff. Maybe we've got someone else who's kind of my you know, assistant or something like that who kind of works around the office. Maybe I have another person kind of in that. Maybe I get a few people and maybe that deal with sales, that deal with my accounting. Maybe I got an office manager. And then here's the big boss. So you see what he's paying everybody else and the big boss is taking home $1,250,000. That is an outlier. That is a massive outlier. That's not one student getting 100 and the next high student is getting an 89. You're talking about somebody who is making, I mean, multiple factors, more than 10 times, it's actually more than like 20 times what this second highest paid employee is making. That is an outlier. That is something that should stand out. And look what happened. The median 
that's an actual modest reflection of what these employees are making. Half of them make less than that, half of them make more than that, and we're in a decent ballpark. This person is making significantly less than this person, but we're kind of in the right ballpark. But I mean, compare this salary, nobody is even close to that salary except the big shot, except the big CEO who pays himself over a million dollars. That is what we're talking about. That mean tells us nothing. That mean is so highly skewed because of this salary. So that's where they talk a little bit about confusion. Which would be best? Well, if you know you're in a situation where you have a lot of outliers, the median would be the better representative. That would give us the clearer picture of what's in the middle. I mean, in most situations, to be quite frank and honest, we'd really like to know both. Because if we have both of those values, that would help me to see back here, the mean and the median were pretty close. So with that in mind, we should think that our data values, it doesn't tell me about the spread exactly, but that it's unlikely we have any extreme outliers. But when we see that kind of difference, that should be our first thought. So that's a situation again, if you are gonna come work for this company, we'll see how you could be swayed. Someone tries to persuade you, be like, wow, the average salary at our company is 200 plus thousand dollars. But then the reality is literally one person makes more than that. Everybody else is down well under 100,000. So you could see how you can manipulate people by just choosing which one of these that you choose to present. And again, these things happen. The University of North Carolina, they are pretty famous that they always include in um, any potential students, they always include information. What is the average salary of someone who graduated with this major? So if you go through, I haven't checked this for a few years, but they used to have the average salary for someone who graduated with a major in geography was, it was a ridiculous knoll. It was like $1.5 million. And you got to look at that and think, what? How could that happen? Geography? I mean, a lot of us, it's hard to even think, what kind of a job do you get if you major in geography? Now, there are, I should point out, there are plenty. But it's not even a common thing that we'd think of. And to see that kind of crazy salary, what the heck is going on here? Well, just to remind you, again, this was the University of North Carolina. And I would not expect you to know this. But the reason this number is so crazy is because there happens to be someone who graduated from North Carolina with a major in geography, and his name is Michael Jordan. The greatest basketball player who ever lived. He owns the Charlotte Bobcats now. He's worth over a billion dollars. All his endorsement money, all the things he endorses, all his other businesses. That's why this number is so crazy. When you're introducing this kind of person and you're doing this kind of a basic average, that is why this number gets so inflated. I don't know what the median is, but that's where, if you were looking at that, that's got to be your first question. For some of you who might be fans of baseball and you're looking at the current um, labor situation, this is one of those same situations. Ownership tries to point out that the mean salary in baseball, I believe it's a little over $4 million, that actually has gone down a lot over the last few years. So it might even be a little under $4 million. But the median salary is something like $550,000. Now, to be clear, $550,000 is still a lot of money, but to see that huge gap. And the reality is that $550,000 is the minimum salary for a Major League Baseball player. So you have literally more than half the league makes that minimum salary. So if I just line all their salaries up in order, that middle number is going to be that 500, that minimum salary. So it's a big difference, 500,000 versus over 4 million. And that's because you have the outliers. You have the extreme stars in baseball who have huge contracts, but most of the players are making league minimum. So, a lot of work done so far. First thing, like I said, getting the sense 
of these three terms, what they are, how to find them, having that familiarity with them, but then we're starting to break through that second wall. Not to go too deep with it, but just to realize there would be situations where one might give me better information versus another. But the truth, the biggest truth, is that it would be best to have all of these values. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, I mean, a quick thing. They point out in the book here, this effect of outliers. They're looking at people who received $0 contract offers and one person who received $10 million. Now, all of a sudden, the average senior received a $2 million contract offer, but that's just not the case. Most of them receive zero. It's this one person. And there's the Michael Jordan story that, they, that I was just referencing. They even talk about it in the book. So, where do we go from here? We're mostly done. For the rest of this, we get a few quick ideas that we'll expand on as we go through chapter six, but we've covered the meat of this unit so far. So just a few minutes left as we wrap this up. First, the shapes of distributions. That when we were talking about fitting that curve, here we had an old bar graph, an old bar graph, here we had a line chart, but for every one of these, we could still just try and fit this smooth curve over those different shapes. And what they try and point out is the idea of the mode is the value that occurs the most frequently. Well, this bar occurs the most frequently, and this bar corresponds to this highest point on the curve. Over here, it's this bar, but maybe we might have two bars that are equal height. So they're just pointing out in these pictures, we can get a little bit of a sense of how many modes that we have. And that here, well, we've got two modes, or we've got one mode. They also mention, again, I'm doing this very briefly because we'll talk about this in greater detail as we go further along, that we're often looking for some symmetry. We don't always have it, but there are a lot of these pictures, especially these two, where there's just this nice line down the middle where you kind of get a perfect reflection. This side is the mirror image of this side. So a lot of situations like height are like this. The average height is in the middle, and most people are that average height, but as you get shorter people and as you get taller people, the further away from the middle, we get fewer people, but it's proportional. So like we were saying, we did this very quickly in class, so just to point this out, if we do this for men, we have 69 inches, five foot nine is the average height. That is that line that divides the middle. So if I wanna know how many men are 66 inches tall? I'd be trying to figure out something over here. 66 is less than 69. And if I wanted to figure out how many men are 72 inches tall, I'd be over here. But notice, I, I didn't pick these numbers at random. 66 is three inches smaller than the average. 72 is three inches bigger than the average. And you know, I'm trying to do this best by hand, but notice, if I went three inches bigger versus three inches smaller, these points are still mirror images across that middle line. So that's gonna help us. If we're lucky enough to have this type of symmetry, that helps us with a lot of our distributions to get a picture because whatever happens below the average, below the mean, we get a similar thing happening above the mean as well. They then introduce this term about skewedness left skewed or right skewed. Skewedness is pretty simple. It's just about if we don't have that nice symmetry, that maybe we're getting our bubble and it's a little bit more on the left side or the right side. But I gotta be honest, for, for me, I mean, if you read the definition, it makes sense. It is left skewed if its values are more spread out on the left side. Therefore, they would be more concentrated on the right side. But what that boils down to, if the bubble is on the right side, you actually get left skewed. If the bubble is on the left side, you're getting right skewed data. So for me, I always remember it as that opposite effect. But people are like, why do they call it that? It's about the variation down here. 
These values, again, very concentrated together on the right side, but the idea of being left skewed is that its values are more spread out on the left side and by default are more compact and consistent on the right side and then vice versa for right skewed. So three terms here, three formal definitions. Symmetric, if the left half is a mirror image of the right half, so that's what we were just discussing, we've got that nice line down the middle where if you literally fold your piece of paper down that line, this part of the curve would flop and completely overlap this side of the curve. And then the left skewed, something looking like this, the right skewed, something looking like this. And this is what I mean. Now they try and give us some questions about, well, what do we think would happen? What do we think about the heights of a sample of 100 women? I don't know why you would know at this stage that it would be a symmetric type of distribution. I mean, I think they're trying to get us to think naturally that if we see tall women, we see equally short women, that, that kind of balances out. You know, but I just don't think that's an obvious thing. So I think it's nice to read through these parts, but you'll notice I don't ask questions like that in the homework, and you shouldn't expect anything like that on the test. The last thing in this chapter is once we have, well, again, something will develop. This comes up next. This comes up in 6B. The distribution stuff comes up a little later. I believe it is C and D that we get back to the distributions. But we gotta realize, like we said at the beginning, we're always looking for more. More information gives us a better picture and allows us to make the best decisions in statistics. So <clears throat> we initially started off, you have the whole data, you put it in a display, that helps. Gives us a better picture of what's happening. Then we just spent a lot of time in this video talking about the middle, the common, the average. Of course, that's something else we wanna know. But another, and it never ends, there's always more. So the next thing that we'd really like to know is this concept of variation. What this has to, what this deals with is all about, is the data spread out far? Or is it compact and tight? Now it's not one or the other, but those are kind of the two extremes that we have situations, this would be a low variation. You know, we've got that nice symmetric picture, but this is not a big hill. So if whatever we're measuring here, you can't go too far below the average or too far above before no one, no object is in that situation. So if these were test scores and it's like we've got an 85 in the middle, well, that would kind of look like nobody got less than an 80, but nobody got higher than a 90. All of those data values are nice and compact. They, some other people might use the word consistent. That the class did consistently well. Or maybe that the average score is a 70, but nobody did lower than a 65 or better than a 75. We wouldn't say they did well, but that class was still consistent. Here we're getting more of a picture of moderate variation, and now we're seeing high variation. So it's, we're seeing that same peaked hill in all three of these, but here, not it's a narrow bottom and more of a taller peak, slightly wider bottom, not quite as high to the peak, much, much wider bottom. This bottom is all about the variation. So again, the variation, how widely the data values are spread out about the center of a variation. So that's all we get for now. We just wanted to introduce that term next chapter, I'm sorry, not next unit, as we move into 6B and we start talking more about that variation, we'll start to see how we quantify it. We'll start off by talking about a simple thing. What is the range? What is the biggest value minus the smallest value? That gives me a picture. So thinking about tests, if the range is only 10, there's only 10 points separating whoever did the best to whoever did the worst. That's definitely a consistent group. Versus if you told me the range was 80, there's 80 points separating the highest test score from the lowest. Oof, that's not good. That's like somebody got a 15 and somebody else got a 95. These test grades are now all of a sudden much, much more spread out. So that's the idea that we're looking into with variation. 
So we'll get several values. We'll eventually start talking about the standard deviation. That'll be the big one, but we'll get there next unit. So make sure you're working through chapter six. A reminder, Monday is going to be a lab day. So we'll probably spend a good few minutes just reminding ourselves on mean, median, mode. I probably won't even mention deviation or variation. So we'll just get practice with all the sense of average, but then we're gonna start using Excel. And then next Wednesday, we'll continue going forward in 6B. That's it, everybody. Have a good day. And of course, let me know if you have any problems or questions.